Good evening, everybody. Uh, I think it's time to start. Um, my name is Roland Kuhn. I'm working for TypeSafe. Uh, TypeSafe is the company behind uh, Scala programming language. Uh, there are a few other talks, talks about that at this conference. Um, the ACA middleware, which is why I, uh, where I'm working with, and the Play framework, uh, web framework. Um, I have should just mention, I, I have put some, some cards and stickers uh, up on this box here, if someone is interested in some, uh, maybe afterwards. Uh, how did I come to work for TypeSafe? Um, I started contributing to the ACA project. Uh, it's an open source project, so uh, I, I found Scala basically in 2008, looked at it, found it nice, and found one especially nice project where I wanted to contribute to. Uh, started in 2010, and um, the first niche I found uh, where I could easily get into it uh, was I looked at the test suite, which was at the time already um, extensive. I mean, we have extended it a, a lot since, but uh, it lacked a common form of these tests. Everything was just uh, a bit cobbled together. So I created the ACA test kit module. Uh, that was my first uh, contribution. And I've since uh, refined it, and we're using it for all tests um, uh, ever since. And uh, have now made it remote, so you can have multi-node tests with injected failures and everything. So that has grown uh, f uh, since that time. And then I also, um, well, made, mostly re redid uh, the finite state machine module. It is uh, something um, modeling finite state machines on top of actors. It's, that's not yet, uh, not really important what it is, but uh, it got me so excited um, that I was working a, a day job at the time in, um, in Munich uh, at the German Space Operations Center and had like 100 150% job, depending on, on, on customers. And then in the evenings and on the weekends, I started hacking to, on this open source project because it was, was so good um, that my wife finally asked me, hey, um, you need to reduce the number of jobs you're having. And that was exactly the time when TypeSafe was uh, announced. Uh, and then I thought, OK, that's nice. That's what I want to do. Uh, let's just let them know that uh, I'm here and uh, available. So that turned out very well. Uh, now I'm, I'm doing as my day job uh, uh, what I really like to do and uh, in the evening still, but there's more time for the kids. That's, that's good. Um, that's how I started uh, getting into this. Um, I've since worked on, on all parts. I mean, the, the ACA team is really, uh, you do everything. So I did, I, I did the test kit in the beginning, but then I worked on like core ac uh, actor ab abstractions, um, how, they, how actors are implemented uh, and at the very low level. And um, there you have all kinds of concurrency problems. I, I, will, I will talk about what actors are. Uh, so I used my own uh, test kit a lot. And uh, uh, this feedback loop um, is, is a pretty good one in, in that team. Mm. So what I wanted to say, and I, I lost it, sorry. <laughs> what I wanted to say is um, this is all grown. My understanding of how to test event-driven systems has grown in the way I described. I started with writing the test kit, then using and refining it. Um, so I thought this BOF might be a, a very good place where um, I could ask, I could present my solutions. Um, I have only partial solutions. I know places, I, I, will, I will tell you later, um, where, where I don't have a solution yet. And maybe someone can, can just, uh, I'm hoping for a bit of a discussion. Uh, I will lay out uh, the landscape as I see it, but um, as if you have anything uh, you'd like to ask or, or hints you, you like to share, uh, please do so immediately yeah? um, as they come up. It, 
this is not supposed to be like a talk with questions at the end, right? So, uh, having said that, uh, let me mm, show you what I'm going to talk about. First, um, I'd like to define what I mean with event driven, what I mean with asynchronous, um, and then my present my, my uh, understanding of conventional test procedures and how that maps onto this problem space, and then show you the ACA test kit. Event driven uh, means that you have some consumer and the consumer does not really run all the time and is busy polling, it only reacts to events. And events are published by someone else, so there's this decoupling, that is a very, very good, good thing. Um, a consumer doesn't necessarily need to know who the producer is or when and how it obtains data which are going to be published. But publishing this event then uh, triggers r the reaction that uh, the consumer wants to apply. And this reaction then uh, may produce other, so may lead to the production of other events or it may not. I mean processing may terminate or uh, it, it might uh, go on, inform other consumers and so on. So event driven means um, that really the events define which things happen and when they happen. Asynchronous means uh, that it is not in the calling context that uh, the reaction is being executed. When you call a method on an object, um, then, well, there's a new stack frame uh, opened and um, everything happens which is supposed to happen as you wrote it down in your code. And when that method returns, you come back to that stack frame which called the method. Uh, that precisely is not true for asynchronous uh, operations. So that means, um, well, first of all, that you have decoupled the time when this event is generated. Yeah? Event generated is kind of similar to the point in time when you want to call a method. But uh, when it's asynchronous, uh, that means uh, that it doesn't happen immediately. It may happen at any later, later time. Uh, but it also means that the context which initiated this is no longer available when the processing ends. So there cannot really be a return value. Um, that has very direct influence on uh, testing these um, uh, processes. What you then usually do uh, when you do not have a return value is uh, that you have uh, to chain operations. One event is processed that triggers another event and um, that is called continuation passing style. An example would be that you register a listener to receive a callback whenever something is done. It would, for example, be uh, you call a database so you make, make a request to a database, uh, but you do not synchronously get back the rows and the result set, um, but uh, you just get back a handle where you can register your listener to receive the callback, which is then invoked for the rows. Another example uh, might be a web service. Um, I tried to pick something. Um, uh, which is uh, closer to um, Java Enterprise than what I'm going to show uh, afterwards. Um, so a web service typically means that you send a request by HTTP to some REST API or something, and uh, when you send it, you do not get the answer right back. Uh, so what you get is uh, a handle where you register call callbacks, and these callbacks are then uh, executed once the reply from the server eventually arrives. But um, between that, the server has asynchronously processed the request. And this may, may, may well be nested. So you call the front end REST API HTTP server, and that um, 
has this kind of uh, processing loop, so to speak. Um, but that may in turn call a back end server which might call a database. Um, so this, this same thing might be ha happening at different layers. Now, test procedures uh, as usually established, I mean JUnit, TestNG and, and, and similar frameworks, uh, a test procedure is just a method usually which is invoked by the test framework and this method runs and when the method ends uh, you need to know whether it was successful or not. It is a synchronous um, sequence of events uh, that happens in this test and it's a single procedure which uh, controls it. That's, uh, yeah, normally you call a method and you check that the return value is what you expect, for example. Uh, that is not really how it works with asynchronous uh, and event-driven um, processing. Um, there you're forced to uh, this different sequence um, that you, in the test procedure, just kick off whatever it is you want to test the behavior, uh, like um, you generate uh, this request to the back end or something. And um, then the test, uh, the, the code under test runs in, in a different execution context. It might even run on a different computer completely. Uh, but eventually the answer comes back. And obviously the test procedure needs to wait until that has happened. So after some time, uh, you assert then that the result has been received and that it was as expected and within the time expected and so on. There are some, some issues uh, with this kind of, with this style of testing. Uh, if you imagine you have an, you invoke something uh, on an asynchronous service and that offers a callback so that you can register a callback uh, when something is done. Now this callback is executed in a context on a different thread, uh, so not in the context of the, of the uh, test routine, uh, which means that you need to safely publish uh, the result if you were to inject your test callback, which just sets a flag or something. That needs to be done using volatile, for example, uh, to get it back in a reliable way. Um, there are other, other gotchas. I mean, if you uh, want to receive a sequence of replies, for example, you kick off uh, a single request which gets fanned out to five da backend databases and you collect the events uh, which get back, so the, the, the result sets. Um, you need to enqueue them in, in a thread safe manner, of course, in order to get them all and, and don't receive some corrupt um, thing. The other thing is uh, you shoot off events and you wait for events to happen. Whatever is in between, you cannot really express in your test. You cannot assert anything about uh, things which are unob unobservable. Only events which are published can be checked. Um, this means that if you have, uh, for example, some worker thread pool which executes uh, some business logic on request. So you submit to this uh, thread pool um, some expensive calculation and eventually you will get back uh, the, the response using a callback. Then you cannot really test the inner workings of this business logic uh, if you just do event-based testing. That cannot be fixed, uh, but I would say it's, it's good practice anyway to factor out this big business logic into uh, some, uh, yeah, factor it out so that it's independent of the way it is executed. So it's just a library and then you can make normal unit tests on that code completely synchronously and you only test the event driven uh, aspects, so the, the, the aspects controlling the execution of the code um, in, in the uh, event driven test, uh, which I would then call uh, a feature test or integration test or it's not the white box unit test anymore. Yeah? So you need to do that on the code separately and then um, 
have different layers of tests. Then, of course, I said the, the test procedure needs to wait. But how long does it need to wait? Uh, what is reasonable? Or another thing is, if you have uh, uh, something, like you want to test a timer that it performs correctly, but um, you, you all know you can have GC pauses or uh, you can run it on a busy Jenkins instance on a, on a small EC2 box or something. Uh, so it might well be that machine load or other, f other factors um, make this test fail because it takes too long. Yeah. There is another thing to be aware of. Uh, it is not deterministic anymore uh, in that sense because you need to have bounded timeouts uh, because uh, otherwise tests would not fail with a good error message. They would just keep hanging. That's also not what you want. And then the fourth point um, is a quite interesting one. If you have not only this, this simple, I publish an event and then processing happens and I get back the result, but instead there is some complex machinery set uh, in motion behind the scenes to produce the results. So several entities uh, working together in an event-driven fashion, sending messages to each other, uh, then the ordering of these messages or the ordering of the processing um, can influence whether that succeeds or not. So in that case, if it makes a difference, then you have a bug. But you're not guaranteed to find it because you might just happen to run on, for example, this very fast uh, notebook uh, uh, where a certain thing just always happens in the same sequence and you don't have extra load which would add randomness to it, so your test always passes. And then you um, run it on like a 12 core box uh, with slower CPU, um, but many more of them, and suddenly you notice, oh, it fails. There's some other sequence which, which just happens on that box. Um, in this, so this means that there, is, uh, that there is a difficulty. That is one of those uh, which I think is not not yet solved. Um, there's, uh, I just wanted to mention um, some related work, uh, so which, which I'm not uh, showing uh, in the ACA test kit, um, but other. The first one being formal verification. Um, imagine you have your event processors, no, mat no matter what they are. Imagine you have a specification for them. They receive events, yeah? Yes, I, so I'm, I'm not yet so deep into that because I didn't have the time. Uh, I just found, uh, I, I found a paper from ICSE 99, which I find, found interesting. I, I'm going to read more into this, more, more, um, uh, more, more up on this, I would say. Um, so you have a finite state machine, which is very well specified. Then you could, in principle, um, apply a, a formal process to ver verify that it, no matter in which sequence the, the events come, it will always do the right thing. But there is a catch. You would have to restrict yourself uh, in what you do in this state machine in order for this specification to be manageable. If you use all language features which you have, so you can have mutable variables in your implementation which can then change, um, which you use in if statements, as simple as that. And then you would have to model that in order to have it correctly in the in the verification. And if you have something which is non-trivial, this quickly becomes non-tractable. Um, this is, yeah, not a complete solution to the problem, I, I would think. Then, uh, the second point, explicit deterministic event scheduling. scheduling. That uh, comes back to the point uh, where you have certain event orders for which it works and others where you have a bug and it doesn't work, um, but you happen to not hit them in your own tests. Um, if you hit them, 
for example, on a production system, which is then always nice, uh, is that you can reproduce them. If you can control the scheduling of the events. So in, the, in your test you say, uh, I know this can happen in all kinds of ways, but please, my system, make sure that A happens before B happens before C, because that, I know, is a problematic sequence. I found it by other means, and I just want to have this test, which is a regression test, so that I don't break it again. I fixed it now, and it should stay fixed. Um, that, is, uh, that is something there are uh, frameworks um, which are attempting to do that, not yet completely there, um, called Bassett and, and Setak uh, for, for ACA. M more work needs to be done in this, in this direction. Uh, we are not currently using that uh, in the ACA test suite. Um, I'm, yeah, the hint is the last one, uh, the last point. That's what we're mostly using. So event schedules may problematic or not problematic. Um, and the problem is that you don't find the problematic ones. You could, if you have a system which controls the order of events, you could basically just exhaust the possibility space. If you have five events, I mean that combinatorics grow pretty quickly uh, in which way these events could be ordered. But if you try them all, then you're sure that you don't have a bug. Again, this for non-trivial systems quickly gets non-tractable. Uh, so what we do instead is, I have quite recently uh, written a test for um, the um, actor supervision hierarchies. That is something where some component may fail, it tells its supervisor and then um, the supervisor says what should happen, restart or something. It's not, not important what it is, Important is, it is uh, a set of 500, in that test case, of these event processing little engines. And they all fail like mad in this case. Yeah, I just kill them uh, randomly in, in the test procedure and uh, inject a half million failures uh, in different ways and different sequences and um, all kinds of uh, configurations, so uh, let's say different exception types, so to speak. And if you do that um, long enough, then you're pretty confident that you found all the problematic sequences. Uh, that actually happened in this test, I think. Um, I, I implemented this and I wrote the test and then for three weeks I was busy Basically, each day I found a new bug, so the test failed, and uh, then it took me a day to find the cause on average and, and fix it. And then I thought of a new test case, a new exception type to throw or something. And again, the, the game repeated for three weeks. But since we have not had a single failure on this test anymore, we've run it 100 times in a row on different servers, different hardware configurations, and now it seems okay. So that is, I think, the most pragmatic approach which we found uh, to date to, to deal with this. So we cannot ex totally exhaust the, the schedule space, so we just try randomly. We sample randomly. And uh, we just trust that, yeah? When you're doing that, do you intelligently search through the, the event space or do you just randomly No, it's, it's quite random. It's quite random. That's the idea. So the problematic sequences will not just be one in a billion. That I won't hope to find. But it, it, it will probably be just a few randomly scattered. And if you just test long enough, uh, you can hope that you hit one. But wouldn't it be better to say, let's say you 50 events, and you can start your chain with event 1 through 50. Wouldn't it be better to say, I've covered at least Ah, in that sense, yes, yes, okay. I should mention that I made sure um, that the kind of failure cases uh, are equally populated. So there is, there is some selection. Th that is true, yeah.
So um, there's a, a high level uh, randomization of what type of failure and then how deep the failure should go. Uh, so there, there is a, a logical selection. It's in that sense, I'm, you're right, it's not completely uh, random. That would not hit much. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you have to think about your problem actually and, and, and customize the process by which, by which you apply the, the random failures in that case. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So I hope I didn't forget to talk about anything uh, important in, in general. If, the, if you have more questions, because then, then I would uh, present the, the test kit just quickly what, what it does and, and how it looks like. Um, yeah. So for that, I need to introduce actors because actors is what I do. Akka is an actor framework. And uh, actors are really prototypical for, for, this, for this kind of problem because they are completely asynchronous. Everything about them is asynchronous. And uh, they only react to messages being sent. They're, they're completely event driven. So the test kit um, has supporting methods for publishing events, which means sending messages and receiving back messages and inserting probes at certain points in your um, actor system, the multiple actors working together. You can insert a probe at some point and uh, sniff, uh, so to speak, the message flow through that point. Um, that also has uh, scoped timeouts. So you can say, these, this bunch of operations should run within two seconds. Um, I found that when, you, when your aim is to write a test suite, which is supposed to be run on some CI servers, um, that you cannot really go below 500 milliseconds. Because 500 milliseconds can easily still be hit by just a GC pause or something. Uh, that can just be a hiccup which makes your test fail. Um, so the typical timeout, uh, the default timeout is three seconds to receive th something. Yeah, and then most of the test kit API is just assertions uh, sh con concerning the different events uh, you, you may receive. So, uh, I'm going to do this uh, in, in Scala. I mean, you don't need to learn Scala here. I just uh, chose to do it because I can then basically uh, quickly and, and concisely write what I mean and you should be able to understand. If you, if you have any questions, just ask. Um, this is just, uh, just some hello world. Uh, object um, means uh, this is basically uh, static methods, uh, roughly speaking. And the app trait the, the app base class basically means that everything in, in the body of the class is in fact in the body of the main method you would have normally. So when, when you run this, uh, it prints uh, hello world. So I have uh, already prepared this with, with the imports you need to create actors. So let's create an actor called counter. Now this counter needs a variable, which, it, which, is, which is an integer starting out at zero. And then, as I said, it's completely uh, message driven. So you just need to define what happens once it receives a message. And uh, I'm using a nice uh, Scala feature, which, which is called pattern matching. Uh, this, is, this is why I do this in Scala, because in, in Java, the code would just uh, take many more lines. Now, let's define the messages. We can give them names. Uh, you could also send around strings, but then the compiler doesn't catch typos. Uh, for this, there's uh, this Scala feature called case object. Uh, we can send it a tick or a get. And if it's a tick, then we'll Let's increase the counter by one. And if it's a get, uh, then 
Well, we have a sender. A, a message comes in an envelope. It has a sender and a recipient. And you can get the sender by just saying sender. And then how do you send a message? That's the bang operator. So sender, bang, counter. Uh, this is, um, this syntax is basically stolen from Erlang. Uh, who of you know Erlang? Uh, just a few. Who of you know Scala, by the way? Or have seen it? Yeah? Nice, nice. Um, so this is, this is basically our actor. Um, that's, that's the whole of it. Everything. Now we need to uh, create one in order to play with it. So let's make an actor system. Uh, an actor system is basically, you can, you can think of it as the container for a set of actors. Um, it manages the, the configuration of common things. I'm, I'm not going to do m uh, much of that here. Just need to know that you need, you need a system. The system will start thread pools, and we do want to shut them down in the end. Now, in the middle, uh, let's create an actor. Yeah, as simple as that. So you say actor, new counter. Um, one feature of, of uh, ACA is that it enforces this encapsulation. So you can only talk to actors using messages, which makes them really completely asynchronous and event driven. Um, and this is why they are hidden behind an actor ref. Oh, this is, this is probably too small. You do not really get the counter back, you get an actor ref representing the counter. Now, we can send the messages like a tick. And we can also, I mean, that's not very interesting because we won't see anything. We can also send it a get. But the get will try to send back a response. So we need something to receive that response. There is something like a mini actor you can reuse for this purpose. Um, I, call it I call it me. That's myself, which is a, an inbox. And this is used by these message sends as the sender reference. So it will receive the replies. So I can just say, well, C equals me receive. And this will actually wait. So these send off events. They generate events to be consumed by that actor. And this one here waits with a timeout of, th uh, of three seconds uh, for a message, any message, to receive to this me inbox. Now I can just, uh, no. print out the counter and see if that works. So count was one. No, that's just, all I'm going to say about actors for now, or is that clear enough for demonstration purposes? So it's completely event driven, everything is asynchronous, it, it demonstrates the problem. So let's look at test kit. Um, we write a counter spec which extends test kit. Test kit, I mean, we want to deal with actors, so we need an actor system. We create one here. I could also give it a name. That's good style. And I use Scala test. That, that's the framework for writing tests, uh, which, which has these. Implicit sender. Um, this is uh, a trait uh, which you mix into this um, test class, which says that the test kit contains an actor which will just, when it receives something, uh, queue it into a queue. And then you can write assertions what the top of the queue a actually is. And um, implicit sender means that this actor shall be used for all send operations, like the inbox in, in the other example. So I have prepared uh, uh, an outline of which tests to write. A counter actor must start out at zero. So let's just 
create one. And when we send it a get, now, so this is all old news. Now comes the first test kit thing. Expect message zero. Yeah? This is, again, the point uh, where we wait. This, in this line, uh, we set off with, we set the thing in, mo in motion which we want to test. And in this line, we wait until a result arrives uh, uh, and then assert that the result was actually zero. Now, if I were to run this, yeah. So the bar is green. Uh, you see the, the first test, yeah, hopefully. You see that that was run. The other one is are not yet implemented. Now we can we can also um, send it uh, a tick first. So a di different sequence of of events, and then expect that the result will be one. This also works, but that's not new. So it's just one more thing. But must not be that slow. That is the, the next interesting one. Um, I told you about scoped timeouts. This is why I put this in here. Uh, so if I have an actor and this is a Scala for loop, uh, no need. To, to worry about the specifics. This just iterates um, i's uh, from, from 1 to 1,000. And for, uh, for each of these iterations, I send a tick. And then I send a get. And now it should be 1,000. So running this. It's still green, but that, that, that's boring. Let's make it red. So what if we actually make it dead slow? By sleeping one millisecond. We do that a thousand times. Yeah, OK. This was the default. I didn't actually put in what I wanted. Um, this, this works because the default timeout is three seconds. But if we say within one second, this should happen. Then it fails. Yeah? And you can see here, it fails at this line. Uh, where was this? Um, with an error message, assertion failed timeout some close to one million microseconds during expect message while waiting for the message 1,000. Yes, yes, that is in the test kit. That is uh, the within. Um, he was asking where that comes from, and that is in the test kit. And you can nest these. So if you have an overall process which is complicated, which may take five seconds, and the first part needs to be done within one second, you can just nest these. I mean, they're, they're lexically scoped, uh, the timeouts then. And they're implicitly used by the expect message uh, and, and friends. I mean, you, you can. This expects message 1,000. You could also expect message type int, for example. I expect message class in this. This this would be class of uh, Java lang integer. That should also work. And uh, there's there's a lot of them. Um, but that is that is basically the essence of it. Yeah, you have a facility to, to receive the replies, the generated events, to make assertions about their order in which they are uh, arriving and the, the, their contents, 
and uh, about uh, the time it takes. You have a question? Oh, it was, I, I'm not sure whether it was in 1.0, but it sure was in 1.1. It's, it's in there since a long time. Yeah. And uh, in version 2.1, I'm proud to announce that I actually managed to make a Java test kit. Uh, so what, what I'm showing here is the Scala version because it's still uh, smaller, on, takes less screen real estate. Um, but the Java version is uh, nowadays pretty close to this. Um, the difference is that if you want to make a within and there needs to be some code running within the within, uh, then there's no choice but to create a new class or a new object. So you must say new, for example, in a few places where that is not necessary in Scala. Um, but the, the Java test kit and the, the Scala test kit are on par now concerning the, the features they support. Yeah? Yes. So if you were to send a tick and a get, uh, then the first one would be one and the last one would be thousand and, and everything in between. Um, then we get them already, yeah. So we expect message. Uh, what we get. Um, so the easiest would be to make a loop again. Yeah. Sorry? Yes. So uh, I was just thinking I, whether you can can but you cannot really get out the sequence in one, in one go. You need to, so you need to call expect message for every um, message which you got, which you wanted to get. Um, ah, no, so this is why I'm confused. You can also say expect message all of, and then uh, pass in a, a sequence. Uh, one, two, one thousand. But that's a bit arcane Scala syntax. So I find this more readable. Um, so essentially, you pop off, uh, pop, pop the, the, the um, oldest element of the queue uh, always and check with, whether it is what you expect, and then you go on to the next. Uh, but this queue can, uh, can hold the intermediate replies. So this for sure will populate the queue um, before. The, the assertion really starts. Yeah. An order is preserved, of course. The, yeah. Well, this expect message all of, we could make it explicit that that's uh, all of one, two, three. They would e expect the values one, two, and three. And then we, we, we can continue like this from 4 to 1,000. Uh, let's see whether I'm making sense here. Ah. So it, it was timing out, because I still have the one millisecond sleep in. It was timing out uh, waiting for message number 780, which also tells you it actually goes through it. Yeah. So. What are your thoughts? How do you like it? <laughs> uh, no, I, I neglected to talk about all of that. So in fact, the default configuration is to spawn a thread pool which has maximum twice the number of cores. And uh, it will then run actors on these thre threads. But we just have one actor now. 
So it will just one thread which is used. Yes, but uh, the current, so w what, what this, this little demo does is I modified the actor to actually take longer. That is not really what you want to do. When you want to test the system, you want to test that system and not some test variant of it to be sure that it is actually the same thing you're talking about. Um, I didn't check the time. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. So, if any more questions, um, out, oh, I, even outside, okay. But thanks for your attention.